Hello, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our loyal listeners and any of you who are joining us for the first time. We appreciate you um, being with us here um, at our virtual book passage events. Um, we are so excited to welcome authors Lionel Shriver and Zoe Strimple to discuss Lionel's latest book, the very powerful and relevant novel, uh, should we go or should we stay? Uh, the fact that the title is a question indicates that there may be alternative answers. Um, I recently turned 60, which doesn't feel old now. In fact, in my head, I'm about 30 still. Um, but up until about 20 years ago, I felt 60 seemed ancient. Um, now that I am here, I find myself looking at things I didn't consider before. Um, I look at mortality different. I consider end of life issues, not in the near future, but at some point, um, which I think is a very topical issue right now. Um, my dad, who was a very bright and active man, he was a physician, passed away a couple of years ago after suffering from dementia. And um, he used to say, I don't want to prolong my life. I, you know, if I don't have the quality of life, you know, I have no reason to. And yet towards the end, it was, it was very interesting and, and sort of um, touching and uh, that he, he got scared and he admitted that he wasn't ready. He still wanted to, to hang around, even though his health and his mind was starting to go. So I think, you know, we don't always know until we get there. Um, Lionel Shriver's new novel centers around an elder, elderly couple uh, bound in a suicide pack. Watching her parents age, the subject of dying with dignity um, was never far from her mind. Both timely and timeless, Lionel Shriver addresses serious themes, the compromises of longevity, the challenge of living a long life and still going out in style with an uncannily light touch. Weaving in a host of contemporary issues from Brexit and mass migration to the coronavirus, Shriver has pulled off a rollicking page turner in which we never have to mourn perished characters because they'll be alive and kicking in the very next chapter. Lionel's fiction includes the Mandibles, Property, the National Book Award finalist, so much for that, the New York Times bestseller, The Post-Birthday World, and the international bestseller, We Need to Talk About Kevin, adapted for a 2010 film with um, Tilda Swinton. Her journalism has appeared in many publications. She's a regular columnist for The Spectator in Britain and Harper's Magazine in the US. She lives in London and Brooklyn. Uh, she is currently coming to us from uh, London. And Zoe Strimple is a historian of gender in modern Britain a flagship columnist for the Sunday Telegraph and the author of three books, the most recent being Seeking Love in Modern Britain, Gender, Dating, and the Rise of the Single. She also co-presents the wonderful cultural podcast, Hyped. So um, please sit back and enjoy this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. You're right, this is a rollicking read. It's also an extremely original book. Uh, in terms of its structure. So rather than a continuous narrative, it has 12 imagined parallel universes. So playing with alternative universes or different paths taken is obviously something you've done before, Lionel, for instance, the post-birthday world, but there are more of those universes here. And, it, and sort of sometimes the book almost reads like a philosophy play, sometimes like a political kind of manifesto. I just wonder if you could start by telling us kind of your thoughts about the form of this book, how you would describe it, and sort of how you came to conceive of its quite original structure and why, why you think that suits this particular topic. Um, you're right that I did choose uh, to use the same parallel universe structure roughly in the post-birthday world in 2008. Um, and, you know, I didn't invent even that. Uh, uh, there are films like Sliding Doors that uh, do the same thing. Um, I, I don't tend to choose form, forms for their own sake. I'm not interested in just uh, experimentation. I don't think most readers are either. There has to be a point to it. And uh, in the post-birthday post world, I was putting side by side uh, a situation uh, where my protagonist was with one man and then the situation where with, she's with another man. And how does that play out? How does it affect her life in ways both 
vast and minute. Um, so, so that there was a purpose to putting it together that way. And it's the same here. I mean, I, it, it, the big question is once my characters get to, to the age of 80, when they have vowed they are going to kill themselves together. And that happens very, very quickly as it does in real life. Um, and uh, are, are they gonna go through with it? And so the question becomes, okay, well, if they were to go through with it, what would they miss out on? What wonderful things that might happen shortly thereafter that, that they would deprive themselves of? Uh, alternatively, what kind of nightmare scenarios might they escape? And so, you know, it varies throughout the book, which, which the, a chapter is representing and sometimes a little bit of both. <clears throat> it's quite because it is a slightly complicated structure, um, but brilliantly done. I mean, you do it very clearly, and and as you have explained, it kind of you are exploring the things they they will miss out on, but also the things they will be glad to miss out on, as well as many other kind of wilder things. But what's I mean, I wondered what it was like actually putting this complicated thing together. Was it ever grueling? Because there are bits where you very cleverly repeated. You know, throughout the book, there are sentences that are carefully repeated word for word or phrases or even paragraphs, which then just subtly veer off. I mean, how did you do that? Did you have like a chart or like a, a, some kind of map where you kind of kept track of everything? Or how, how, what, what can you just sort of, one, you know, just about the form again, just the experience of writing something as kind of carefully constructed as that with those repetitions that you, you don't want to make any mistakes with those. Um, and it just reminded me of a bit of a mathematical puzzle, really. Well, I, I structured it in a slightly different way than I did post-birthday. With post-birthday, you've got just these running realities side by side and it, it goes, you know, there's there are two chapter ones, there's one chapter one, but there are two chapter twos, two chapter threes, et cetera. And a single closing chapter. This one has a, a structure, not so much splitting off from a single moment. In post-birthday, it's a kiss that either happens or doesn't happen and completely changes this woman's life depending. This structure is more what I would call arboreal. It's like a tree. I gave myself permission to pick up from any point in, in the narrative that I wanted to. And that's what those repetitions that you're talking about. I'll repeat a paragraph or a line. I expect you to recognize it. Uh, in fact, the first time it happens, it's like, oh, you know, the, the editors made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I've read this before, you know, gosh, Harper Collins is really losing it. <laughs> Maybe Shriver too. Um, but then after the paragraph is over that you're like, what the hell is going on here? Something different happens and it splits off to go somewhere else. But what's, what was tricky about the arboreal the, the branching off like that, um, and sometimes it will branch off more than once, is that I had to watch my continuity. So, for example, there is one reality in which in anticipation of, <clears throat> of no longer being here after uh, March of 2020, uh, they spend all their money. I mean, absolutely everything. And they refinance the house. They're totally in hock. It's the way all of us should die, really. Um, and in, the, in another branch, they, they are very uh, frugal. They decide in advance that they're not going to go through with it and that the key is to just plan ahead. And therefore, they're you know, they invest carefully and they don't go on a bunch of foreign, foreign holidays and spend their money. And therefore, you know, they're well provided for. Although in ironically, in one of those realities, it didn't matter that they saved all their money because the currency is worthless and they've, you know, the world has gone through a complete international financial collapse, which readers of the mandibles will recall is one of my particular fascinations. Right, well, that's, that's fascinating. Um, so the action of the book really begins in the early 90s, but um, 
it really then unfolds either in a kind of wild future or in it's quite heavily presentist. So, you know, it's a current affairs book as, as Alison flagged, Brexit, COVID, migration, the NHS, there's a lot about the NHS, um, which I'll, maybe we'll get to a bit later, but I just wanted to- For you, Americans, that's national the National Health, Health Service. Service. So the National Health Service being kind of complete, you know, everyone is obsessed with it, it comes up, you know, it, it's like, it's the, it's the kind of extra presence in the room at all times. But, um, so it's very, and actually I wanna ask you later about the Britishness, the, the kind of, yeah, the Britishness of this book. But first, you know, always very interesting with you, Lionel, because obviously you're so plugged into punditry and being a, being a columnist and being on, you know, question time and all kinds of political, uh, vet, you know, TV, things like that. And you're, you know, highly regarded in, in that regard. Um, this is, if this is a current affair novel, what are the, so what, what's the advantage to writing a current affairs novel versus a, a column, for instance? I mean, this is something I've asked you about before, but I think it's, it's interesting given your profile to just, yeah, reflect on that, that sort of split between the, the journalism and the, the fiction. Oh, for one thing, I can have my characters, different characters believe different things and espouse different things. Uh, whereas in a column, you are pretty much a, obliged to pursue a particular viewpoint and line of reasoning and you more or less only address the opposition to shoot it down. Uh, a, a novel is a bigger, baggier entity than a column and it can afford to contradict it, itself or to have characters uh, violently disagree. Um, I mean, Cyril, the husband is a passionate remainer and it's pretty much a matter of public record that yes, I did support Brexit. Uh, so, you know, I still gave him a full voice about his opinions. I mean, that said though, you know, all of these uh, contemporary issues that weave through the book, uh, there's not a lot of the, a whole lot of the content of the argument in the book. After all, it's not a book about Brexit. It's not a book about COVID lockdowns. It's using, using what's happening at this time to explore the relationship or, you know, to be, it's much more playful than, than, a, than journalism and, mm. and, and therefore even more fun. But in sort of as in still hedging it with with these sort of current affairs, what are the sort of pitfalls and advantages as a fiction creator to doing that? I mean, do you think about how something is going to translate in 10, 15, 20 years? I mean, I just think there's a bit of it's a bit it's hard to do as, as a reader. It can be, you know, it can be annoying reading a current affairs novel. Yours was definitely not annoying to read. It was very smart. But I think it must be as an author, you think, OK, how can I do this? I'm in this moment. But is this not just sort of, uh, how am I gonna avoid this just coming, you know, coming across badly in, in five, 10 years time? Well, of course, whenever you set something in a particular time, you risk dating yourself in some way. Uh, oddly, one of the ways that you prevent uh, dating yourself is to set it in a very particular time and in a way that never dates because that is what happened then. So it's always what happened then. It's uh, it, something might have happened later, but that's still a matter of historical fact. Um, I I I know that there's always a risk of alienating your audience because they disagree with you, which is one of the one of the reasons it's not a very good idea to be polemical and to be arguing a very specific position. You know, you you're you're in danger of losing your audience. And besides which fiction readers do not go to novels in order to be lectured, they don't want some kind of political pamphlet. Um, I'm hoping that this will last partly because, you know, the present that we're talking about is just a jumping off place. So that, you know, there's even one chapter which ends up, you don't even know how many hundreds of years from 2020, hundreds and hundreds of years later. And so that just, it's, a, it's using a point of, of familiar reference to, to shoot off into other places, often quite into the future, um, 
And therefore, I, I think that the, the familiarity of that point of departure is grounding. And, you know, as long as we still remember what I'm talking about, that, the, you know, we went through the pandemic, we, we, we used to get really upset about Brexit for reasons we can't seem to recall. <laughs> uh, I think that will that 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 moment in time will still serve that grounding purpose. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, having also had the privilege recently to read your previous novel, uh, *Motion of the Body Through Space*, that is about an aging couple who fall out over exercise and their response to bodily decay. Um, mm -hmm. Both there are other similarities. Both couples have an overweight and annoying daughter. Um, I, I mean, that, that's just something I noticed. <laughs> but um, I just wondered, yeah, if you could just share with us this kind of intense focus now on, on bodies, aging and disappointing families. And just, mm. like, yeah, what's, what's going on? Is there that? any other kind of family? <laughs> I mean, maybe in fiction, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I've had an enduring interest in the relationship between the self and the body, you know, the the, the travail, travails of the body. I mean, so going back to 2009, I um, wrote about the US healthcare system and uh, someone whose wife is, have, has mesothelioma. Um, in fact, every character in that book has some kind of health issue. It's, 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 a, it's loaded. Um, and in Big Brother, I wrote about uh, obesity. And of course that was very familial. Uh, obesity is a familial issue. And in um, The Motion of the Body Through Space, I'm looking at the exercise industry and the, our increasing uh, almost religious faith in exercise to give us all uh, eternal health and eternal life. So it's an ongoing a uh, uh, concern. I, there's no way it doesn't get more concerning for me because it, like everyone else, so it's not just me, um, I'm getting older and having to contend with all of those travails and complications and disappointments and uh, looking at end of life as it hurdles towards me. And you know, if you look at Philip Roth, he did exactly the same thing. He started writing obsessively about illness and mortality. So I hate to say it, but expect more of the same. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, what, one of the themes that's coming out of responses to your book is that it's an uplifting and warm hearted um, mm -hmm. departure from what one reviewer called the sort of more scolding sequence of books. Um, so I don't one like that word. About. Yeah, that, well, I, I mean, that, you know, I can understand that I wouldn't use that, but someone used it, but I guess it's just this, this thing of, would you agree with this assessment of a sort of change? Oh, now, you know, this should we stay as a kind of, this is warm hearted, the other ones. I mean, I, I don't particularly, you know, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily agree with that assessment, but what do you think about that, you know, impression given? Do you think this is a warm hearted book? Oh, sure it is. I, I would say that especially the uh, the wife Kay is very tenderly portrayed. She's likable. Um, Cyril's a little more difficult, but it's an affectionate portrait. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a little domineering, but then he's also a a man of his time. I mean, he's a generation older than I am, born uh, during World War II, uh, so it's forgivable, and he gets. He improves in certain scenarios. He becomes a better husband and a more open-minded. Uh, so yeah, I, th I did deliberately set out to craft characters in this book who were accessible and in many regards, ordinary. They are not supposed to be weird or extreme. They are meant to be regular people. I did put them in, uh, medicine because I thought it was pertinent to the topic and I thought it made it more likely that they might come to such a rash resolution um, mm. 
that they don't want to live beyond the age of 80. But otherwise they are, they're just meant to be regular people with a few quirks. And I, I, I think one of the ways I tried to signal that to my reader is that while I have sometimes chosen um, rather uh, Baroque names, they have very ordinary names, you know, Kay and Cyril Wilkinson. And I, I made sure that those were Christian names that would have been fairly common when they were born. I wasn't trying to make them seem exceptional. And that's unusual for me. And mm -hmm. I liked it as an exercise. Hmm. It's interesting that that translated into, yeah, I mean, exactly as you planned, people could identify with and warm up to these normal characters who were, who were kind of going through this quite sort of like morally taxing and depressing potentially kind of series of decisions. Um, I think that well, was very, it was it was very important to me not to write a depressing book. Uh, yeah, that was not the intention. The, the intention was to have a good time for the reader to have a good time. And uh, the whole setup, the whole all, all of my major formal decisions were to get the reader to enjoy him or herself, him or herself to enter into the a, a sense of frolic and play and in imagination. Obviously uh, that way I'm cutting across my subject matter. It, ob obviously if I, if I tell you oh, I just read this great book about a suicide pact, you're not necessarily gonna run out and buy the book. I, I, and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the suicide pact that it interested me so much about the project as the spinning out of all these different possibilities, which is positive. You know, it's, it's not dark. It, it was, it was fun. It's meant to be fun for the reader. Um, and, and therefore it's, it's, you know, unlike some of my books, it's not meant to be a downer. I mean, that said, you know, I, I have a, I have a, uh, I think an undeserved reputation for, for being dark because, you know, I have way more happy endings than I'm ever given credit for. <laughs> I don't know where people are getting this idea from then. I mean, certainly in this case, it's a real feat to pull off, as you say, a fun book about, a, you know, a suicide, yes. really. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, it seemed fun for you, which is fun for the reader, because you know you you do very thoroughly push. You know, the, what what does it feel like to be in cryogenically preserved for potentially millennia? What is the moment when you when the when the cry when you suddenly get heated back up again? I mean, you, you take the trouble to actually imagine that, which is really interesting and fun. And so, so I think I think you have you know I think that's one of that's sort of the secret to the this well one of the secrets to this novel is that. It's, it's, it's damn undepressing and yet about a very serious issue. So, I mean, Alison referred to it right at the start that, you know, facing mortality straight on, especially as one ages, is, is, is there's no fun. I don't think, I personally am not looking forward to that. Um, but I wondered if maybe, if there's just something you wanna say about, which is probably obvious, but maybe worth reflecting on, you know, the, this, this moment in time and relationships to age and sort of the body and its illness being sort of ever more concealed because basically people are fine. I mean, Western medicine allows you to hide a lot of bodily decay under the, you know, every, you don't go around and see death wherever you go. So in a way, as you, I think, point out in the novel, death is, is a shock, bodily decay is a shock when you see it, we're not used to seeing it. Is there anything you want to say about this moment in terms of your reflections on aging and, and, and that kind of thing? And also if COVID actually did change the way we think about illnesses and bodies, or actually if it just confirmed the fact that we're petrified of anything bad happening to our bodies, which then leads to this kind of very uncomfortable relationship with aging, or maybe, maybe we don't have an uncomfortable relationship with aging. I don't know. Um, there's one thing that I'm, kind of torn on because I, to my knowledge, I've never been alive before. Uh, I do find the process of getting older and facing death shocking. And it, it's a, it makes me feel stupid because 
I have known that people get old and die pretty much my whole life. And I've been watching it my whole life. Why is it so surprising when it happens to me? But it's still surprising. It's still a shock. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> and this is what I don't know. Is, does that make me typical of my generation? Is that our, our, our times? And are we so used to denying death that we've convinced ourselves that it never happens? Are we so uh, into the availability of plastic surgery and you know, vitamins and you know, exercise that we think that we're gonna live forever and then we're surprised when it doesn't work? Or have, has it always been like this? Has it always been like, it, it, has it always seemed shocking to actually get old and die yourself? And there's probably an interplay of both of those. I think that we, we resist aging more than we used to. Uh, we believe that because life expectancy, life, life expectancy has been uh, increasing our whole lives, that it's gonna keep doing so. And ideally, if it keeps extending and extending, then it will, you know, we're never gonna die. So there's some of that going on. Um, but I do think that there is something about every aspect of being alive that is surprising that you, when you fall in love for the first time, it's like nobody else has ever fallen in love, but you that, so no matter how much everyone else goes through these rituals of being born and living a life and finally kicking it, it's it's new to us, it's new to everyone. And I think that registering that is one of the things that fiction writers are good for and sharing that, okay, I don't know what it's like for you, but for me, this is like very hard to get my head around. I, I, I should have been ready for this and I'm not. So how's it been for you? And you know, that's, that's one of the things we use fiction for is to, to, to share that kind of thing. Yeah, and you very bravely get, you know, down and dirty with imagining or portraying Kay in one version who has else who, you know, the first moment she forgets a word and then mm -hmm. how that unfurls. So, so it, I can see how, yeah, fiction is a kind of interesting tool for, for kind of facing the sheer weirdness of it for everyone. I mean, historians are always interested in how you know, did people in the past feel grief when their children died because they died so frequently? Yeah, they did, you know? <laughs> yeah, they did. So, yeah. Um, uh, okay, great. So, um, you know, one of the amazing things also that you get, that you do is, you know, you do pull no punches when it comes to uh, saying things like, you know, the UK is going to be, well, in one of the scenarios, taken over by migrants who kind of lock Kay and Cyril in the attic and feed them a kind of African gruel. Um, it's a sort of, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dystopian vision of unchecked migration. There's also a great sequence, which I found very amusing, but it was to do with gender identity and sort of jamboree of, of Kay and Cyril and everyone else trying on different bits of male and female genitalia and stuff. So I'm always amazed and intrigued by your ability to write the completely verboten things. Um, and I'm just gonna ask, you know, how do you get away with it? Do you get away with it? Um, and what's the secret? Because I'm, you know, both of us are, interested in this kind of issues around free speech, but your speech is very free. So, you know, how, how does it, how do you do it? <laughs> well, you know, you can get away with a, a, any number of things as long as you're funny. Uh, the, the catch to that is that your audience also has to have a sense of humor. So I think we know the people we're talking about. <laughs> There's a certain set of people less inclined to laugh. And I'm never going to please those people. So, you know, I, I try to get away with my various little heresies <laughs> by making a joke about it. And there's usually some larger truth that it's getting at because that's, that's what humor does. That's why it works. Um, so I, I had an, another interview that you were the other day call me up on a couple, it's just a couple of lines 
in um, in a chapter in which aging has been cured and everyone more or less has eternal life. And so people go through fads and burn them out. And one of the things that becomes a fad is not just changing genders, which becomes recreational, um, but also changing race. And uh, this seemed very, um, my, my interviewer was obviously very anxious about this passage, but it's, it, it's a paragraph in which you're told that uh, nobody wants to be white. <laughs> it's all in one direction. All the white people want to be black and the black people really resent their ranks being infiltrated by uh, these fake black people and that you can't tell the difference. Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, of course, an example of cultural appropriation, which I expect my readers to know I have opined about in, at great length. So that's kind of an inside joke. And then I say that, you know, um, by, the, by the end of the fad, uh, the most people have, have mostly fastened on turning themselves Smurf blue um, <laughs> until everyone was completely tired of the whole issue of what your skin color was. After all, if you can just change it, who cares? It doesn't have any more meaning. And eventually even the word racism uh, morphs into meaning something else. And so it refers to uh, uh, an enthusiasm for uh, driving cars very fast, you know, you know oh, oh Lloyd, he just bought a new Ferrari. He's really into racism. <laughs> I found that so funny, I have to say. <laughs> and you know, it's a little risque. I know I'm skating on the edge, um, but it's funny. So I think I get away with it. And furthermore, what I'm genuinely saying is I can't wait for us all to get over race. Like I'm sick of this. Uh, the answer is not, not um, identity politics and being obsessed with it, but to finally get beyond it and find the whole issue irrelevant. That to me is my Valhalla. Mm. I mean, both you and me, or I, which, well, I don't know, whichever one, um, Lionel kind of, or at least, okay, I'll speak for myself. I write a lot about curbs on free speech, for instance, at, you know, universities and things that people are afraid to say. So even if there aren't technically curbs, people are very afraid of saying things that might get them in trouble. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe those kinds of fears, you know, there's, there's all this very polarizing lingo about woke this and the free speech camp is there. And, you know, is this actually, is the whole culture war, could we say, overblown? I mean, are columnists like me actually making too big of a deal of it? I mean, if you are able to, you know, get random, you know, get your publisher to, to sort of happily allow things like racism as fast car <laughs> fetish, you know, it's, maybe there is no problem. I don't know. Well, or, or maybe it, there's a problem in, there isn't a problem with the letter of the law, or maybe there's an appetite for, for fun, you know, fiction that does that kind of thing. But if you're at a university, it's a different story in the US, maybe it's different from in the UK. I don't know. What, what's the, what is the scope of the problem? The real problem? I think the problem is real insofar as it sometimes does involve people losing their jobs, their livelihoods, their reputations, uh, becoming unemployable. And that does happen on occasion. Uh, and that matters a lot. If it's just, a if it's just name calling, uh, the answer is to grow a thicker skin and don't take people seriously just because they're hurling insects at insults at you. Um, I, th I think part of the solution insofar as there is one is to um, not take other people's rules seriously. I mean, someone like me could decide, you know, there are all these prohibitions now. So I could take them seriously and I could obey them, but I don't have to this is not a matter of law, it's just a matter of Twitter. It's a small number of people who have nominated themselves to boss other people around. That includes, you know, issues of language. You know, I do not have to use ugly language and stupid jargon. 
you know, I, I, I am actively annoyed by the expression people of color. It's arcane. It's a ridiculous construction. It's an obvious avoidance of colored people. Uh, it's strained. So I, I have, I don't use it and I don't put it in my columns or my books except to make fun of it. Um, and you know, my feeling is you just can't force me to use your vocabulary. Uh, nor do I have to acknowledge these made up rules. You know, for example, cultural appropriation, I'm gonna appropriate my little heart out and I expect <laughs> others to do the same. And I just think we're, we're, we've allowed ourselves to be too anxious. And that anxiety has been fortified by the fact that some people genuinely have lost their jobs. And that is no joke. And I think that that, that is genuinely grave. And in the publishing industry, I mean, you in that uh, iconic, um, eponymous spectator column where you talk about, you know, the, the new kind of um, checklist of, of minority statuses or marginal statuses that were very skin color based, that being a criteria for choosing authors. I mean, it did seem for a minute that, that there maybe was going to be decisions based on art, you know, art would come to be shaped on, including what you do, writing novels, would come to be shaped almost entirely by a kind of, by, sk by skin color, basically. So, I mean, has that moment passed? I mean, obviously it, you're still able to kind of, um, you know, do your thing. So, you know, publishing maybe appeared to be in a worse, maybe it was, it was looking more punitive than, than it's turned out to be, would you say? I don't think that we're, past the historical moment where, you know, wokeness, so to speak, rules, uh, especially in publishing. But I will say that at a couple of junctures when I've, my, usually my sense of humor has got me into trouble with the, tw the twits. Um, I've been very fortunate. I, uh, you know, my ed editor at uh, The Spectator has stuck by me. I've never been threatened uh, with uh, having my column taken away unless I get into line and avoid certain subjects and, and you know, am more, more respectful and don't make jokes about inappropriate subjects. I never get any, any guidance from my editor whatsoever. Uh, and uh, furthermore, my publisher, Harper Collins, has stood by me and um, has never uh, threatened me with, oh, well, you know, we were going to publish your book, but now you have brought us into disrepute. So I'm sorry, but we're canceling your contract. That has never happened. It has happened to other people at other companies, but not to me. So, you know, if we're talking solutions, the solution is for people and uh, positions of authority to grow a pair and to be loyal to their authors and their employees and their faculty uh, and stick up for uh, these people's right to their own opinions, even if that those are not opinions that the people in authority share. Mm -hmm. But uh, a little more loyalty would go a long way. I'm afraid that we're seeing a lot of cowardice at the top. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shifting back to the book, or at least a sort of stylistic part of the book. So I'm a, a fellow hybrid with you with the uh, English and American. I would say I don't speak any other languages, but I do speak American and I speak English. Um, so, you know, for me, reading this book was like, it was like, an, a, it was the thoroughness of the, of the sort of submersion in English idiom was like, you know, really striking. So you know, this felt to me like a deeply Anglophone book. There are phrases from, you know, omni shambles, sod that, I'm sorry, awfully, characters, which actually my grandparents used to say washing their teeth instead of brushing their teeth. So that's perfect for their age. K, you know, never really fancied smoked salmon. Cyril only eats bacon, not only, they eat bacon buddies. So it really just made me feel, God, English really is its own language. And, you know, you've obviously mastered it as well as, as, well as American, your native tongue. Um, so, I guess the question is just about audience and sort of, mm. do you think, did you want to write it 
an, an, Amer an English audience or do you think Americans will be able to kind of cope with the sheer linguistic difference of this novel that is in English, but literally in English? Um, you know, it's also, I guess the wider question is how British is this book? You know, can, will, will Americans be able to get on board with the National Health Service stuff? You know, Boris Johnson. I guess we'll find Brexit, out. You know, yeah. I just wonder if it's like, if you were thinking, okay, through the specific, I can do the universal and actually through this highly English idiom, that'll be okay. Like people will be able to, I wonder how it'll translate actually into Italian or something. Um, uh, we'll see. Uh, I, that was the biggest decision I had to make before starting the book is where to set it. And I remember being on the fence and I, I talked to an audience at one of my events in North London and shared with them my quandary as to whether to set it in the UK or the US. And it was almost universally agreed that I sh it was about time I set another book in the UK. <laughs> Um, so I farmed the decision out. Uh, I thought it was time I, I put a book in the UK again as well. Uh, I've lived here for over 30 years. And as for the idiom, I was really surprised how naturally it came to me. Uh, I think when I, uh, the other book that I set here uh, post-birthday, in relation to the idiom uh, is in, in, with one character in particular, I may have been trying too hard. And in this book, I just relaxed because I, I knew to say washing your teeth. It just came naturally to me. So I wasn't, you know, on the internet trying to figure out uh, what do the British call you know, <laughs> a trash can. In fact, quite the contrary. I often have to puzzle out whether or not Americans still say trash can because it's not a can. It hasn't been a can for decades. Yeah. So in other words, I, I have become, if anything, more, this sounds boastful and it, it is likely to backfire. Um, but it, I've just lived here a long time. And so the idiom comes as easily or more so as a, a, an American one does. And it was a pleasure to take that in the idiom out for a ride, you know, and, and to just inhabit the British landscape and the British, British locution, British vocabulary, British ways of thinking, British institutions. That said, you know, I don't think I'm asking uh, American readers for a lot. It's a very small hop across the Atlantic. It's the same language. And the truth is, Americans have been importing Britishisms like fury. I think a lot of it has to do with the miscegenation of our television. And so, you know, I hear, hear and read people uh, using words like, oh, that's a little dodgy or that's spot on mm -hmm. all over the place. And in fact, that, that expression that became so popular a few years ago don't get your panties in a twist, which mm -hmm. Americans thought were, was incredibly witty and fresh and didn't realize, um, or many of them didn't realize anyway, that, it, you know, don't get your knickers in a twist is, is a very old expression in Britain. It's been around forever and is anything but fresh, but it just went around the U.S. like wildfire. And I've just seen this happening more and more. So I would say that maybe they are not familiar with omni shambles, but for the most part, Americans are going to find this book very easy reading. Mm -hmm. Damn, I, I thought you were going to say they'll find it really hard because this makes me feel kind of like I speak two languages, but maybe the gulf isn't so big between English and American. That, that literally, I, I, reading this made me think, oh, I have such a fine grasp of this, this alternative version of English. It's so different. But as you say, probably anybody would be able to <laughs> to understand. Yeah. I, I, I had to fight for this, but I actually uh, got them to use British spelling. Yeah, okay. Well, that's interesting. Actually, I remember from think even slang words from like Love Island and various other um, reality TV popping up in, in the US. So that, that's, an, that's an interesting point, actually. The direction of travel has been the other way for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, in a way, this is, as you 
hinted at or said, this is this is sort of also a book about marriage, um, its joys. Um, but to, in, to me, also another sort of overlap with the previous book, Motion of the Body Through Space, is what I consider to be the sheer annoyingness of the husband. I mean, obviously fun to read, but, and I start, you know, there's in both cases, Serenata in Motion of the Body, Kay here, you know, the women are amazing. They've got superior, they've just got resilience, they're kind, they're patient. Um, I mean, you said you, you seem to be fond of, of Cyril, but I did, couldn't help but, but wonder if there, if there is a sort of concealed point about gender, you know, and also in the post-birthday, I mean, there is, your, your, your men can be a little hard to, to love. So I just, I wondered what, if you're kind of consciously doing that or what you think about that. I could be a little hard on them, but I usually rescue them in the end. Um, they're just, they're usually a little slow. Uh, funnily enough, the motion of the body through space is, has a central concern, especially with white male Americans. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the book overall feels sorry for them. After all, your author always feels sorry for the very people who, with whom you're not supposed to sympathize. It's yeah. a perversity of mine. And mm -hmm. I don't think this is a great time to be a white American male. It's, it's uh, your bottom of the totem pole and you're told that you've had it great for too long and now we're gonna show you, so shut up. That's, yeah. that's a disagreeable yeah. position to be in. And, and I did try to feel my way into that in, 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 in a way that is, uh, you know, compassionate. And yeah. in this one, even Cyril, though he starts out kind of bossy and domineering, is allowed in a chapter to, or two to grow beyond that and to become yeah. warmer and kinder and regretful about his previous paternalism. And, you know, it's, yeah. so it's not a, I haven't crammed him in a box that he can't get out of. I, okay, I'll accept that. And I also just realized that I was meant to say, and I failed, questions. Um, you can type questions through the chat function. Um, I hope that you've got some building up that you can now just whiz, whiz up onto the chat. Um, uh, or maybe some of you are clever and have figured it out anyway. So um, that should be obvious uh, how you do that. So we've just, you know, we've got another 12 or so minutes left. So that, that, that should give time for a few good juicy questions. And meanwhile, I'll just ask Lionel something else. Um, I mean, I guess like I have just, you know, maybe I'm preempting some questions from the audience, but you know, you, I, I, you know, you've written, sometimes you have written books one after the other one, you know, one year, then the next year, obviously you did that last year and this year. Um, I mean, how do you, is it, are you tired? Or do you need a break? I mean, what's it like writing that amount of fiction in, in such a short period of time? And did lockdown help or hinder? Um, lockdown helped this book. Uh, I've never written a book quite so quickly. Now I miss it. Um, in some ways I wrote it too quickly because I'm kind of off my rhythm. And also I think that subsequent lockdowns after that first one, I mean, uh, Americans aren't necessarily paying attention to what's going on in Britain, but you know, it's been a solid six months over here. That This is the third lockdown. It's still not quite over. I think it's, uh, I have found it demoralizing. And it's, it's given, with the first lockdown gave me lots of energy because I just had, I had a project and I was able to focus on it completely. And now I've just found the whole reaction to the pandemic so discouraging that uh, it's taken the wind out of my sails a little bit. I hate to admit that. So I need to kind of juice myself up again. Um, yes, I mean, of the topic of your, your feelings about lockdown and, and the pandemic response could merit an entire other session. We do have um, a question, um, which is, 
how do you compare the culture around death and dying in the US versus Britain? And do you have a subject for your next book? Hmm. Okay, yes, I do have a subject for my next book, which is why I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, I'm not sure there is a dramatic difference between the relation to death and dying in our two countries. Um, I mean, I, one of the biggest differences is that uh, Britons are, or, the, or at least they didn't used to be, uh, as frightened financially of, of illness and, and decay, that there is a national healthcare system and you can worry about uh, dying and, and becoming unwell, but you, you don't have to worry about money. And that's a huge difference. Uh, I'm afraid one of the things that the pandemic has done is I hope not irreparable harm to the National Health Service, uh, which now has a, a queue of 5 million people in it and counting. So um, that sense of security that Britons have had in relation to their health care is starting to erode. And I'm really sad to see it go. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't necessarily have predicted that. Um, anyway, on to the next question. Where do you get your ideas? Well, of course, the, the short answer is that I haven't a clue. Um, I, I, they hit me when I'm not looking for them. They seem to come in from the side. Uh, I read a lot of newspapers. And so some of the content of my work is fed in that way. Uh, this particular book was inspired by a remark by a friend of mine uh, who, who said that uh, she had no desire to live beyond about the age of 80 and I, I thought about it because she's a serious person and I didn't think that she made it, made that assertion whimsically. And so I couldn't help but imagine, you know, what will happen when she does turn 80, is she gonna do something about it? Is she gonna follow through on that? And that is, you know, the rest is recent history. Uh, uh, there's no simple answer to where your ideas are from uh, the key is just to know know how to recognize a good one from a bad one. Mm. Um, okay, we've got another one. Um, what is your view, Lionel, of social media and do you see any value to it? I have so perfectly boycotted social media that I am the last person you should ask whether it has any value because I wouldn't know what I was talking about. I instinctively avoided it from the beginning. Uh, it's obviously uh, capable of becoming a big time suck that I don't have room for in my life. And also uh, I'm uneager to present myself for other people's target practice. And I don't, uh, I don't want to put myself out there to be insulted or abused. And the easiest way to do that is to deprive potential trolly people of my availability. So, you know, my, I, I would rather just publish something and put it out there and I don't need to hear about it. It's hard enough to go through the formal reviewing process. So there's an element, I, I would admit, of, 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 of kind of cowardice. <laughs> I'm, I just, you know, if you don't like me, I don't want to hear about it. I, I mean, that's, I don't know why more people haven't figured that one out. Um, it seems like a, a genius way to, to kind of deal with, with things. Um, I mean, as we're drawing to an end, I, I think, actually, I would just be interested, I think maybe other people would, again, just in the, the sheer sort of art, your craft, rather. Um, how do you, what is your kind of ritual or routine in terms of how you begin to, to plan and then write a book? Do you have a thing where you, you know, like Anthony Trollope, where you get up at 
five in the morning and you do four hours and then you have a break or how do you do it? How do you literally, you know, people really struggle to get stuff down, you know, and do you have any advice for fledgling writers? Well, there's, there's no secret. There's no special scheduling that, that is going to solve your writing problems. I mean, I don't encourage you to keep my schedule. I, um, I, uh, especially since the lockdowns, I've been staying up until five, five thirty in the morning. So, you know, it's talk about social distancing. <laughs> yeah. I'm just completely like, you know, 10 hours out from everybody else. Um, and this is only made possible because I'm self-employed and also because there is no social life now. Um, uh, but there, there was another question. Um, I suppose it was just, I think you kind of answered it, which was just sort of, if the, well, I, well, actually the first one was what, what you do to kind of start, you know, what is, I suppose your pro- your Oh, was pro- what, what advice? Yeah. How do you physically, how do you, how do you get going? What's the first thing you do? Well, I would, I would just give the same advice that I'm now having to give myself. Um, don't faff about and get on with it. Don't, don't indulge rituals. Don't indulge superstition. Don't tell yourself that you're not ready or that you'll do it tomorrow. You just have to sit down and start. Okay. And without a lot of ceremony, that's your ceremony is your enemy. Yeah. You know? Get words uh, on the- yeah. It needs to be work a day and ordinary because mm-hmm. otherwise you're just going to make yourself frightened because it, Oh, like I can't stay, start a book until it's a special day. It doesn't have to be a special day. <laughs> that sounds like great advice. Um, well, I think Lionel, all that remains is for me to thank you heartily for, you know, totally fascinating kind of answers to my slightly haywire questions. And also just to say this book is deeply interesting, probably the most sort of grippingly interested in, book you'll you'll find this year so thank you very much to everyone um thank you for your questions and yeah thank you both so much zoe and lionel um i know it's it's late your time Uh, apparently lionel that's that (laughs) is in your within your schedule these hours i I, i'm similar just after breakfast (laughs) yeah right I'm, i'm a late night person so i know how that is but um thank you both so much it was a fascinating discussion and and I think readers so appreciate your handling difficult subjects with um, with a sense of humor. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have a difficult time with that, um, who struggle with humor. But I think it's it's the key to to dealing with difficult issues. So thanks very much, and thank you to all of our um, watchers, our viewers. Uh, we appreciate it, and I encourage you to purchase this book which is uh, available, of course, through Book Passage. And you can either call us and have it sent to you, pick it up. Um, You can order it on bookpassage.com. And if you know anyone who would like to uh, watch this uh, conversation, you can suggest that they go on our uh, Zoom channel. We have um, all our conversations available there. And thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe and be healthy.